Hi, I'm Casey. I am a professor in an information science department who has been running PhD admissions for a number of years. And this is officially my last video in a series about PhD admissions. Because this video assumes that you are in the awesome position of having multiple acceptances to PhD programs. So if that's the case, first of all, congratulations, you made it. This is the best position that you could possibly be in at this point. But now you have an important decision to make. And I wanna say first that I'm going to give you some ideas for the kinds of things that you should be thinking about in making this decision. However, in the end, this is a very personal decision and all the things I'm gonna be talking about, people are going to weigh them very differently and understandably. Someone with the exact same slate of choices than you might make a totally different decision and it will make perfect sense for them. And the good news is, a lot of the time, you can't go wrong. If you are agonizing over this decision because you have two options and both of them seem super awesome, they probably both are. <laughs> and so whichever decision you make, it's gonna be great. But if you're in the process of making a big old pros and cons list, maybe this video will give you some ideas for things that you should think about. So let's start with, if you know this, who is your advisor going to be? And as you've heard me say before, how important this is to your PhD experience, your research trajectory, etc varies a lot in different fields and for different programs. But if you are in a place where your advisor is going to have a big impact on your PhD experience, I did a whole video about choosing an advisor and the kinds of things you might want to take into account. So I will point you to that video, I'll link down below, in case that's a decision that you're making. You also might have already decided on a program or be pretty sure which program you want to enter, and there are multiple faculty who could potentially be your advisor, in which case that video might help you think through that as well. But relatedly, beyond your specific advisor, what is the overall landscape of the faculty? Are there other people that you could see yourself working with? And there are multiple reasons why that might actually come up. What if your advisor left the university? What if they retired? What if it turns out you don't get along as well as you think? Or what if your research interests drastically change? In these cases, is there someone else that you could see yourself working with? Even if they don't seem like the perfect fit, like your hopeful advisor does. And to be clear, the odds that your PhD advisor is going to leave academia to become a farmer halfway through your PhD is quite low, but you know, possible. Plus, you're gonna need committee members and other mentors beyond your advisor. So what do you think of the faculty as a whole? Is their research interesting? Do they teach classes you'll be excited to take? Do they seem like nice people that you want to be around? Though on the topic of classes, let me make a note about this. Typically in a PhD program, your classes are not the most important thing. However, if there are classes that are offered at the graduate level in this department that seem super awesome, that also probably suggests something about the research focus of the faculty who are teaching them, which is really important. But overall, I wouldn't let the kind of program of study and the course catalog dissuade you too much from a program. Remember, in two or three years, you'll be done with classes anyway. Usually half or more of your PhD is just research. And you take classes as a PhD student to give you the skills and domain knowledge that you need to do your dissertation work. But also, don't freak out if you look at a course catalog and don't see classes and the exact thing you want to do your research on. Because also, as a PhD student, you don't need classes to learn things. <laughs> you should also find out about the general structure and requirements of the program. And what do you think of them? Is there anything that gives you pause? Let's say, for example, you're considering computer science PhD program, but you mostly want to do human-computer interaction research as opposed to building things. Are there technical requirements for the program or classes that you'd have to take that you really don't want to. Though again, remember that you're not supposed to know everything going into your PhD, so I wouldn't let this dissuade you too much. Maybe there are things you need to learn, and that's fine. You can also find out about, say, the general structure of the 
qualifying exams or prelim exams or whatever version of that there is. These do tend to be pretty different in different programs in terms of their structure and sort of how much of a gauntlet they are. That said, I can't imagine picking a program based on this unless like they are putting you through some kind of literal obstacle course and like half the PhD students fail prelims every year. Probably not the case though. <laughs> now something that is really important potentially, the culture and the community, particularly the other graduate students. And also if you're doing a virtual admissions visit, this is gonna be so much harder to figure out and I'm sorry. But my advice again is to talk to current students as much as you can. Ask them about their experience. Figure out if they're friends. Do they like each other? Do they hang out? Do they speak of the faculty fondly? Are there social events in the department? These might not seem like things that are so important when you're thinking about the kinds of research that you get to do and the rankings of the programs that you've been accepted into. But remember, this is your life too. This is five or six years of your life. You want to be happy. And honestly, if all of the students in this program seem miserable, that's a huge red flag. That said, people do value these things differently and that's fine. For example, what about work-life balance? I talked about this a bit in my video about choosing an advisor, but this is also something that could be part of the overall culture of the department. See how the current students are doing. Do they seem happy? Do they seem really overworked? And does it seem like they're getting that pressure to be overworked? Ask about things that are important to you. If you tell someone that you don't work weekends because you spend time with your family, do they respect that or are they horrified? <laughs> Obviously being a PhD student is a lot of hard work, but it is absolutely possible to do a PhD and to still have a life and to be happy. So just try to keep an eye out for how the current students seem and what the culture of the department seems like in this respect. Assuming this is something that was important to you. And something else that may be differently important to different people, prestige. How much do you care about rankings. How much do you care that in 20 years when you tell someone that you have a PhD from this place, they're going to be really impressed? <laughs> Hard to say. It's also possible that the things like importance of program rankings matter differently in different disciplines for, say, job prospects. For example, if you are applying to law school right now, I would tell you to go to the best law school you get into. I don't actually think this is quite the same for PhD programs personally and in my experience. I think this is in part because there are so many opportunities as a PhD student for your work to speak for itself and for you to gain prestige as a PhD student. In law school you mostly take classes and get grades. <laughs> as a PhD student you are publishing, for example. So it's a little bit different, a student who goes to low-ranked university but has publications in the top venues in that field is going to look better than a student who went to the top program in the field but hasn't done anything while they're there. That said, it is sometimes the case that highly ranked programs are highly ranked for a reason, maybe in terms of the faculty there or the resources or whatever, but if it looks to you like all of these other things I'm talking about are very, very high for a program that might not have as much of a name. I would think carefully about that. But again, how much you care about these things is gonna vary for different people. And also, what about location? This might matter to you a lot or not at all. How much do you care about the weather? Or living in a city versus a college town? Or being close to family? or being somewhere where your partner can get a job. These are all reasons why I've seen someone pick one program over another, and they're all totally valid. You're gonna be in that place for five or six years of your life. If you really, really, really hate the snow, then don't go to University of Minnesota, right? But only you can make the decision about how important that is to you. Also, 
Keep in mind how rare it is for a department to hire a PhD student out of their program as a faculty member. I mention this because sometimes people seem to think that getting a PhD in a certain place means that they have a better chance of getting an eventual job in that place if it's like their dream location. That's probably not the case. I mean, the academic job market in general is just so variable from year to year that there's very little point in trying to decide where you might want to get a job. But getting a PhD in a certain place probably slightly lowers your chances of eventually getting a job there. That said, if this is your dream place to live, I wouldn't let that stop you from going there because the odds that they have a job opening the year that you're on the job market anyway it might be kind of low. And so if it's your dream place to live, you might as well live there for five or six years. And another thing related to location is cost of living. And this relates to funding, which is something that you should absolutely be taking into account. But again, how much this matters, very personal decision. And of course, my general advice is to not go into a PhD program that doesn't offer you ND funding at all if you can avoid it. But also, of course, stipends vary. Funding models vary. The amount of other things you pay for, like fees or health insurance, vary. And these things can sometimes be difficult to compare because, for example, stipends go farther in Indiana than they do in San Francisco. So this can be another thing that you can get a really good sense of by talking to current students. And again, how you weigh all of these things is really going to be up to you. What is going to impact your life the most and the things that are important to you? One way to think about this is that you should consider both how this program will help you meet your goals and aspirations and how happy you think you'll be there you might actually make decisions where it feels like you're kind of deciding between those two things. And I think that tipping it in either direction is completely fine. But one thing that I would encourage you to do is at least think about all of these things rather than making a decision based on a single dimension. Like who's offering me the highest stipend or what is the highest ranked program or even what seems like the best research fit for an advisor. But what I really hope is that you're in a position where you have multiple good options and you can't go wrong. So don't anguish over this decision. It is a big one, but regardless, you're gonna get a PhD and what really matters is what you do when you get there. I did answer a handful of questions about this in the live Q&A that I did, so I'll link to that if you wanna check it out, as well as videos about admissions visits and choosing advisors and the kinds of places that I think people might be in at this point when I'm filming this video. And again, this is the last step in the admissions process. I might do a couple of videos in the coming months about, say, the things that you might do to prepare for starting your PhD. But I expect from here on out I can do a lot more about general academic advice and other things that current grad students might care about. So if you're in that awesome position that you know you're starting a PhD next fall, first check out my video with advice for new PhD students. And also stick around because I'd love to keep hearing from you in the coming years. I mean, that's kind of exciting. The thought that someone watching one of these videos right now to get advice might be watching a video in five years on like advice for the academic job market. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, if YouTube had been exists in five years, let's hope so. In any case, wherever you are in the process as you're watching this, I wish you the best of luck. Feel free to leave questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And I'm Casey. Thanks for watching.